Hey, welcome back. We're going to uh, pick up today talking about Franklin Roosevelt and um, the uh, election of 1932 and the New Deal, and uh, you know, which was of course Roosevelt's approach to handling the Great Depression. Uh, so to begin, uh, we look we left off with uh, Herbert Hoover uh, and the uh, unfortunate catastrophe of the um, Bonus Army March on Washington in the summer of 1932. Um, which became, of course, a public relations um, disaster for Hoover, as if uh, the uh, Depression itself had not been enough of, a, of an issue for him with uh, people living in shanty towns, which they called Hoovervilles. Um, he now um, uh, is caught uh, up in this uh, cataclysm uh, where the army uh, burns down this uh, camp of, full of veterans and uh, drives them out of Bayonet Point. Um, and now uh, he's going to enter the electoral season um, with this um, additional issue hanging over his head. Um, the Democratic Party that year will run three candidates. Um, first would be Al Smith, uh, who had run unsuccessfully against Hoover in 1928 and will now uh, seek um, once again uh, the presidency in 1932. Um, the Speaker of the House, um, who was a Democrat from Texas, uh, John Nance Garner, better known as Cactus Jack. And, um, and then the Democratic governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had actually um, taken uh, the governor's seat in 1928, um, uh, was elected to that position in 28 when it was vacated uh, by Smith, who, of course, ran uh, for president instead. Um, the presidential uh, convention, the Democratic uh, National Convention, is held in Chicago in that year. Um, there's somewhat of a stalemate there. Um, John Nance Garner of Texas has some very uh, powerful support and influence at the convention because um, uh, William Randolph Hearst, the publisher uh, who has a massive influence in the state of California, controls um, a, a great number of the, of the California delegates. Um, and then, of course, uh, Garner from the very large and populated state of Texas also controls a lot of delegates. <clears throat> so a little bit of overnight horse trading goes on at the convention um, where Roosevelt's handlers um, broker a deal with Garner's uh, people uh, that uh, Garner would uh, sort of give over his delegates to Roosevelt in exchange for the vice presidential nomination. And so that's that's what winds up happening. Um, Smith gets sort of shut out, um, and coming out of the convention, uh, the nomination of Roosevelt, uh, Garner, uh, would be the Democratic ticket. Um, Roosevelt was in Albany at the time um, that he became his party's nominee. Um, up to this point in American electoral history, um, it was traditional that the um, actual candidates did not attend the convention. They would be uh, in their home states or serving in their current offices, but would not um, attend the convention. And they never accepted the nomination at the convention. But Roosevelt decides to break with tradition and fly from Albany to Chicago to accept his party's nomination on the convention floor. Uh, on the flight from Albany to Chicago, uh, he writes his acceptance speech uh, in which he um, speaks of a quote-unquote new deal uh, for the American people. Uh, and when he gives this speech at the convention, um, the American public is going to eat it up. Um, he's made an early promise of, of, of making things right for the quote-unquote average Joe in America. That's my quote, not his. And, um, you know, uh, Roosevelt's um, sort of optimism and promises of something different resonate uh, with the public. And, uh, it gets quite a bit of stir. Uh, moving into the campaign season, of course, Herbert Hoover is going to, um, you know, not have uh, any greater political skills than he's had up to this point, nor campaigning appeal. Um, he remains sort of mundane, politically unskilled, um, and now he had um, a record to run on, um, which was uh, not a very good one uh, based on uh, the way the Depression had worsened between 1929 and 32. And then he had the additional public relations nightmare of the bonus march fiasco um, that had just recently taken place that summer. Roosevelt, on the other hand, um, 
had a, a, a pretty strong record um, as New York governor of being a person who sort of, uh, along with his wife, Eleanor, um, studied and, and tried to address the problems of the people of New York. Um, he was a good campaigner, very, very savvy, very skilled, both with with people, um, with opponents, with the press, um, and he had an as we uh, a, a, excuse me an impressive voice on the radio. Uh, Roosevelt had a, a, a very uh, interesting cadence and manner of speaking um, that was a bit jaunty. It's been described as jaunty, um, but he he was a highly educated, um, very effective speaker and um, knew how to deliver a speech. And so um, radio became an excellent medium for Roosevelt uh, during the campaign season. And um, his manner of address, uh, his sort of optimism, his confident tone, uh, and uh, his obvious intelligence sort of, not that Hoover was not a very intelligent man, he was, but he was not a good speaker. Uh, and um, there was a very stark difference between the two uh, in their radio addresses to, uh, to the public. Um, so in, during the period of the 1932 election, of course, um, economic conditions were very poor in the United States. Um, Roosevelt uh, winds up winning. He had a very clear-cut majority uh, in both uh, the popular election and the electoral college. Um, so it was, it was very much a, a landslide victory for Roosevelt in 32. And that we enter this very awkward period um, that's been referred to by historians as the inner regnum, and, and that is the period between reigns, uh, to sort of derive from the Latin there. And um, this period awaiting the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt was one of the most sort of awkward, long, uh, per six-month periods in, uh, in U.S. history, as people are waiting for Hoover uh, to leave and uh, Roosevelt to come in and try something new. Um, during this period, um, Europeans are not, of course, repaying their their war debts. Uh, Hoover had declared a debt moratorium, you'll recall, in 1931. Um, and Hoover asks Roosevelt during this period to make a joint statement with him uh, to the public um, that he's going to maintain the debt moratorium. Uh, and moreover, that he's going to um, continue with some of Hoover's policy. Hoover, uh, Roosevelt, of course, um, refuses. He doesn't want any sort of taint of association with uh, Herbert Hoover or his ideas. Um, and his advisors are telling him, you know, the worst possible thing you can do is start appearing with Hoover, and people are, are going to believe they're going to get more of the same. Um, during this period, during the six-month period, banks continue to fail in the United States. Um, and Hoover, while he is still in office, is blaming Roosevelt's failure to cooperate with him for the continuing bank failures. Uh, so uh, nonetheless, FDR continues to avoid any discussions of policy publicly. He quietly appoints a cabinet um, that, so that they're ready to go to work as soon as they take office. Um, and actually, even the day before his inauguration, um, the country witnesses a tremendous cycle of bank failure. Um, and sort of this is what he will step into. So um, Roosevelt, assume, he's inaugurated. He assumes his new administration early in 1933. Um, he has large Democratic majorities in both houses of Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate. So he would um, ostensibly have very little problem getting things done as long as he could convince Congress of um, the utility of his plans, right? So he, he starts off by asking Congress for broad executive powers to deal with uh, the Depression crisis. And since they're all primarily of the same party, even though not everyone uh, in the party is necessarily keen on Roosevelt's ideas, they understand that um, they do need to try to do something. So uh, his first act is um, to take a resolution to Congress for the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act. Um, and this um, created a holiday, a four-day bank holiday in the United States that would stop the um, cycle of bank failures um, that was going on everywhere. Um, along with the same day, uh, also, um, the, the uh, Congress passes a bill proposed by Roosevelt to inject $2 billion of capital into America's banks to shore them up. So 
um, Congress passes the, the bill authorizing this $2 billion injection of capital into banks uh, to, to study them, while at the same time, they're shut down for four days per um, an executive order by Roosevelt. Uh, banks were going to continue to stay closed for a little while. Federal bank examiners um, went into banks and examined them to make sure uh, that they were healthy. Um, when federal examiners said that the bank had sufficient reserves in its vaults to continue operations, the bank would then be allowed to resume operations. Um, so this was designed to slowly rebuild confidence in the bank and stop the runs on banks. That was where people lined up and took their money out uh, of a bank, which just basically emptied it and prevented it from doing business. Um, so that was his first thing was addressing addressing the bank. So um, it's interesting your textbook um, characterizes Roosevelt's approaches um, upon uh, taking uh, office as um, saving capitalism. Uh, and so, you know, we see right away, um, shoring up the banks uh, was a critical, uh, critical means of doing that. So looking at the New Deal, um, and, and, you know, we look at this period of the first hundred days, as they're called, of Franklin Roosevelt's first administration. He passes a sweeping legislation. A lot of, a lot of major programs uh, are instituted by the federal government um, in this first three-month period uh, of his administration. Um, and while the New Deal is very commonly viewed as radical, um, actually, critics of Roosevelt um, would say that the package was conservative, right? So there were some saying it was radical, and there were some saying it was conservative. Um, Roosevelt always stressed that it was experimental, which is probably a good way of thinking about it, that Roosevelt was willing to um, experiment and try uh, anything to try to um, stimulate, the, stimulate the economy, help the poor, solve the unemployment uh, crisis, et cetera. So he did a lot of experimenting. But um, if, we, if we were to look at the New Deal, right, as a series of programs, so we can, we can um, sort of chronologize the New Deal as running from 1933 to 1939. And I was happy to see that your textbook does sort of bifurcate the New Deal into two programs because there are historians <clears throat> who argue that there was no first New Deal, there was no second New Deal. Um, rather, they, they characterize it as one continuum, one program. And I've always disagreed with um, that characterization uh, of the New Deal. Um, the New Deal um, was two programs, uh, the first from 1933 to 35, the second from 1936 to 1939, and that there, there was a first and second New Deal. Um, and that's sort of what I'm going to emphasize in this lecture today. The first New Deal was a relatively conservative package um, full of emergency measures that were uh, in place to shore up the financial system, the stock market, um, and industry and agriculture, the big sort of pieces of the American economy. There were relief measures, um, but most of it was primarily for the system rather than for individuals. The second New Deal um, was much more radical, much more left-leaning, um, involved more reform measures than relief. Um, it looked to reform the economy more than to provide relief to shore it up. And there was much more in the way of sort of direct assistance to the people. So um, there were definitely two very different programs um, with sort of different objects that became necessitated uh, by shifts in the political winds uh, of the 1930s. Your textbook refers to these shifts as uh, critics of the New Deal in, in one section there um, and the sort of summary at, at the end of the chapter. Um, as I was taught it um, as a student, uh, based on the, the uh, authorship of Arthur Schlesinger, uh, and this is Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr., not Arthur Schlesinger the, the Elder, there were a father and son historians. Uh, Schlesinger uh, was um, part of Kennedy's Camelot, and um, Schlesinger was a, uh, he wrote a major uh, 
trilogy uh, of Franklin Roosevelt uh, uh, presidencies um, uh, in the 1930s and early 40s. Uh, so in his massive three-volume uh, works on Roosevelt, um, Schlesinger referred to this criticism of uh, the New Deal as thunder on the left, and that's how I've always um, sort of characterized it and, and told you so um, here in this lecture. So we look at the the um, the first New Deal. You know, again going back to the first hundred days of Roosevelt's administration, we saw um, the Federal Emergency Relief Act pass. Um, where um, Harry Hopkins, an aide, uh, very close aide of Roosevelt's, um, is uh, advising him, and this allocated $500 million for hospitals, schools, and other sorts of municipal on the ground agencies um, in American communities. Um, we saw the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act, uh, which I just mentioned a few minutes ago, um, the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and this set up um, uh, sort of run by the run by the U.S. Army, uh, where barracks were constructed. Uh, in, I think 47 out of 50. Oh no, at the time there were um, 48 states. So 47 out of 48 states, um, the uh, nation um, built uh, public projects, parks, roads, trails. Um, did uh, sort of forest conservation work. Um, also construction projects, um, and it was designed uh, for unemployed single men between the ages of 17 and 27, mostly from large cities. You wanted to get these large crowds of unemployed young men off the streets uh, where they couldn't cause problems, right? And it recruited them to work six-month tours of duty um, in national parks or on these construction and road projects. Um, they lived in camps, they slept in barracks, um, but it was considered a very controversial program in some ways because the camps were run by army drill sergeants. This was, of course, during an era of isolationism and pacifism. Uh, they, um, men were woken by bugles, they did calisthenics in doing their work. Um, Republicans didn't like this at all. Uh, they saw that the terms were too short that the men were serving. And they think that Roosevelt is essentially raising um, a nation of young Democratic voters, right? Um, they thought it smacked of fascism. It's kind of like the Roosevelt youth. Everybody does their six-month tour of duty where they're getting a job working for Roosevelt. Um, everybody gets some money. Um, they, I mean, they lived in barracks where they ate dinner at the big bench tables under portraits of Franklin Roosevelt uh, tacked up on the walls everywhere. So... A lot of people saw it as a, uh, a recruiting um, sort of a scam where we're just drawing these young people into the Roosevelt youth. Um, not, not unlike the way um, the AmeriCorps program uh, was viewed um, not too long ago um, by, by conservatives. So um, this was meant um, really to sort of help impoverished city families. Um, no blacks were admitted to the program for the first six years, and this became a major issue, um, which the NAACP um, would take up. Finally, um, in at, toward the very end of the New Deal, 1939-1940, we would uh, see segregated all black camps and um, also Native American camps uh, appearing later on. Um, the FDIC was a very important program. This was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, um, which operated like an insurance company. Uh, banks had to pay insurance premiums, um, and the FDIC would insure deposits in a bank up to a maximum of $2,500. Um, this was a long-range reform for the banking industry, and essentially the purpose here was that um, people would put their money back in the banks. They would be confident that should a bank fail, the federal government would guarantee their deposits up to $2,500. So this was meant to infuse um, cash and capital back into the economic system. Help to shore up the banks. In fact, the FDIC is still with us today. If you ever walk up to a bank, uh, you will see a black and gold member FDIC sticker in the front window as you walk through the door. I would always recommend that when you approach the door of a bank, you look for that sticker. And if you do not see it, you turn on your heel and go back to your car because your money is not safe in that bank. 
Okay, so that's been that's been with us since uh, 1933. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority was a major um, government construction and utility uh, apparatus that was created uh, to help the people of Appalachia, really extending from West Virginia down all the way into northern Alabama, uh, helping to relieve poverty in this area by um, creating hydroelectric dams, um, which became a sort of a, a government operated utility um, authority. Um, they also built schools and hospitals and things like that. Um, people were displaced from their homes. Um, this would have been what we would call eminent domain, right? People were just told, you got to get out of your house. We're doing construction here. We're building roads here. We're putting a dam in here. And uh, people were thrown out of their homes uh, in order to make way for quote unquote progress. Um, the government then would um, build these hydroelectric plants in the area and sell the power. So the government goes into the utility business here. So this was a highly controversial program at a number of levels. Um, first of all, uh, displacing people from their homes uh, for the purposes of progress for the region. Um, secondly, this was the government going into the utility business, which to a lot of people smacked of socialism, creeping, creeping socialism into the system. Uh, this is what happened in socialist countries. Governments ran the railroads, governments ran the utilities, right? So this uh, was a troubling um, program for some people. Nonetheless, it opened up um, this region um, and began to liberate it from the, the grip of poverty it, it had been in for a very, very long time. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority, interestingly, still exists today. And it actually came up in a, a recent presidential press conference because it, it was it was brought to the attention of the president that the president of the Tennessee Valley Authority currently has an $8 million a year salary, uh, which is uh, <laughs> staggering. And uh, so uh, the president of the Tennessee Valley Authority makes more money than the president of the United States, which uh, obviously took the president by surprise. Um, uh, but it's interesting that it's still operating and that uh, the executive of it makes that kind of a salary. Uh, the most controversial program of the first New Deal was a National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, which uh, had two titles to it. There was Title I of the program and Title II of the program. So uh, Title I um, established the National Recovery Administration, uh, which was uh, headed up by General Hugh Johnson, who was a, a former World War I general, um, who became the uh, executive of a large tractor company. And he's brought in by Roosevelt to um, administer the NRA, the Na this is not the NRA, not the National Rifle Association, National Recovery Administration. And then there was, um, Title II was the PWA, the Public Works Administration, which was um, run by the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, uh, one of Roosevelt's cabinet members. The NRA, uh, the national, the NRA, that Title I of the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA, um, was probably the most controversial program in the entire New Deal, uh, first or second. Um, it was a grand plan to sort of solve the problem of price cutting uh, in the United States. Companies um, kept cutting their prices because of uh, their over overproduction, their inventories. Their inventories were very high, and they kept reducing prices to try to sell off their inventories. But this ultimately made all of uh, the companies in any particular industry weaker, right? A lot were driven out of business by uh, people undercutting. Uh, each other in terms of their price prices. And then, of course, when businesses fail, leads to more unemployment, uh, less sales. So uh, because there was less purchasing power out there with more people unemployed. So it, it was a, a real spiraling effect in the manufacturing uh, sector. So this was really designed to regulate the manufacturing output uh, of our country. Um, This program was in trouble from the beginning. This was um, loosely based on Hoover's idea of the associative state. You'll recall voluntary associationalism, right? Um, 
Each industry had an association, a sort of manufacturer's association. Each was act to each was asked, excuse me, to participate in the formulation of a sort of code authority for each industry, right? So you would have um, an authority made up of uh, a third of any industrial, a third of it would be industrialists, a third would be labor representatives, a third would be public representatives, and they would decide on rules and regulations for each industry, right? Uh, what would be standards of prices, uh, standard wages, standards of working hours, um, industrial standards for the actual products themselves. Um, this was illegal. <laughs> I mean, this was um, contrary to both the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1912. Um, it, 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 it was constitutionally uh, not sound. Um, this was the same system that they had in effect at the time in fascist Italy. So this was really just an American version of industrial syndicalism. Um, if you can get labor and industry to agree, right, then you could eliminate price cutting, eliminate strikes, establish prices. But also, you end the free enterprise in doing this, right? So, so how do you enforce? How do you enforce this? Is the other question, right? You're you're violating antitrust laws. You're imposing sort of European sort of industrial syndicalist models on an American free market capitalist model. And then, how do you attempt to enforce this, right? So, um, the idea was that each code authority um, uh, set up the standards, and then if you met the standards, you were able to display a Blue Eagle sticker uh, in your store window, right? And this said, uh, we do our part, right? And this, the idea was that public opinion would draw customers to those businesses who did their part, who were trying to help combat the Great Depression, right? Are, are you... Um, are you observing social distancing right now? Are you doing your part, right? So I mean, it's a similar kind of thing, right? Um, you're going to be, you're going to be, have, you know, if you're not, right? Um, and if you protest against it, you're going to be criticized for it. This is a lot of what's going on right now. Now, right or wrong, right? The same kind of conversations were going on about businesses. Were you adhering to the standards set up by the National Recovery Administration, or weren't you? If you were, if you had a Blue Eagle sticker in your window, people would shop at your store. But if you didn't have that Blue Eagle sticker, people were going to think you weren't doing your part to help in the crisis and your business would suffer. So um, it was a real sort of interesting take on uh, an intervention by government um, in the free market here. Um, in fact, if you watch Hollywood films from the 1930s, right? Some of which are mentioned in your textbook. Uh, your textbook mentioned Duck Soup by the Marx Brothers. If you ever watch Duck Soup, and you can just watch the opening credits of it, bring it up on YouTube, Duck Soup, just watch the opening credits of the film. You'll see they display their NRA. It's a black and white movie, so you don't see that the eagle's blue, but you see the, that that Hollywood studio was following the Code Authority's regulations for the film industry, and they proudly display their, their eagle um, at the beginning of the film. So um, this was a very widespread thing in the United States. Um, of course, industries were not happy with this because um, the big companies in all the industries were able to dominate the codes, uh, right? And smaller companies um, suffered under this. Um, so in fact, there was a Supreme Court case. Uh, your textbook does not, um, your, your textbook doesn't attach it to the failures of the NRA. So what, when it talks about the NRA um, lo losing out in 1934, uh, what ultimately happens is there are court challenges to the case, uh, to the um, program, the National Recovery Administration. It goes to the Supreme Court, and it mentions that the Supreme Court breaks down the, um, the NRA based on its violation of the antitrust laws I mentioned earlier. This all stemmed from a, a, a court case, Schechter versus U.S., better known to history as the Schechter sick chicken case, um, because um, what had happened was this poultry producer in New York State, I believe they were in Long Island. I'd have to go back and do a, a search and read up on the actual particulars of the case. 
but there was people were getting sick in uh, New York City, um, um, showing up at hospitals with food poisoning, people getting sick. And um, so they did some contact tracing, to use a, a modern term. And um, they followed up, why were all these people getting sick? Where are all these admittances coming from? They're finding out that all these people got sick from eating chicken. So they traced, okay, well, where did you get your chicken? And they traced these, uh, you know, whether they were to the markets or restaurants where they had um, purchased the chicken and found out that all of these uh, businesses had been supplied by the Schechter Brothers Poultry Company. And, um, and, and, and this farm, it was learned, was not following the codes, right? So um, they had their blue eagle taken away for um, selling chicken that um, was not um, adhering to the inspect inspection codes for um, their industry. So anyway, this goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court strikes it down that the NRA did not have the right to regulate their business. Why? Well, number one, only the government is allowed to, um, first of all, the this was a collectivist thing, right? It violated antitrust laws. That is true. It also, vent, uh, your, your, your textbook will later mention the interstate commerce clause, okay? Um, but it doesn't attach it to this. What happened was the NRA punished this business for the way it conducted its business in the state of New York. In other words, uh, this farm outside the city was selling chicken in the city, right? But this was not interstate commerce, okay? Per the 1887 Interstate Commerce Act, the federal government only has the right to regulate interstate commerce, that is co commerce between two states, between New Jersey and Delaware, between Pennsylvania and New York but not within a state, that is intra-state commerce. And the, the uh, problems resultant from the Schechter Brothers operation of their business were a case of intrastate commerce. So here the NRA was not only violating antitrust laws, they were violating federal um, commerce clause as well. So this is why um, the program was uh, eventually uh, deemed to be unconstitutional. Um, the other half of Title II of the National Industrial Recovery Act uh, was the Public Works Administration, the PWA. And this took hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from the federal budget for public works projects in order to put more people to work, right? Uh, building roads, building tunnels, building airports, building uh, bridges, building schools um, in order to put people to work. Massive, uh, just sort of federally... Um, funded, sorry, um, public works projects, right? Um, similar things were being done under Hoover. You'll recall under the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, uh, the massive Hoover Dam, for example, was built. This was, this was similar to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, but these projects were just being conducted on a much larger nationwide scale. And by the way, uh, again, going back to why some people viewed um, the First New Deal as being possibly fascistic, and people were critiquing uh, Roosevelt as possibly being a fascist, was that, um, for, so first we talked about this sort of Roosevelt Youth Program, the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, right, which was sort of eerily similar to some people to the Hitler Youth, but now we have the Public Works Projects, which are a mechanism that Adolf Hitler had been using in Germany to pull Germany out of the Depression, right? So we're seeing him experimenting with these sort of European models um, for economic recovery, okay? Um, so that's a lot of sort of what was going on in the first New Deal. I mentioned the FDIC um, a little earlier. That was um, a product of the Glass-Steagall Act, just so um, I can attach that to a particular piece of legislation for you, 1933. The Glass-Steagall Act was what created the FDIC. And then the other um, important pieces were um, the creation of the S Security Exchange Commission, and that was the um, Securities Act, which created the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which uh, was given the job of policing the stock market to make sure that no uh, underhanded uh, or unsafe practices were taking place uh, with regard to sales of uh, stocks and bonds. So uh, companies had to uh, publish um, information about their solvency, and uh, so people knew 
what kind of companies they were investing in, what they were buying stock. You know, they, they knew what they were getting from the company, so they had to be um, transparent about the, the health, financial health of their companies. Um, and then also, <clears throat> it um, prohibited certain sort of practices like insider trading, buying on margin, um, and um, prevented um, irregularities um, in, in the stock market. So, as I mentioned, oh, oh, and I forgot the Agricultural Adjustment Act that was meant to deal with um, agriculture. And the problem with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, although it did help uh, raise farm prices and increase prosperity uh, in the farming sector, uh, this too would be uh, struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional because it paid farmers not to grow stuff. In other words, farmers were told you may not produce a crop, and we are going to pay you not to produce a crop. And uh, this also uh, was a violation of antitrust laws because this operated, quote unquote, in restraint of trade. And that is the, um, the language of the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act, was that businesses, monopolies, could not act in restraint of trade, right? You, you prevent other people from being able to do business. Uh, and in this case, the government itself was acting in restraint of trade by t telling people they weren't allowed to grow things. So uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act um, also shot down by the Supreme Court. This, of course, gets Roosevelt very upset that um, I think your, your book mentioned nine cases uh, that appeared before the Supreme Court. Uh, seven of them uh, were uh, resulted in rulings uh, unfavorable to New Deal programs. So Roosevelt is having a hard time with the Supreme Court. He's getting criticized for being a fascist by some people. And then people on the left side of the political spectrum, and some on the right, uh, in the case of Father Coughlin, but there were those, uh, particularly on the left of the ideological spectrum, um, people who were further left than Roosevelt in his own party, who were criticizing him for not doing enough. In other words, his as I mentioned earlier, most of the programs that he had instituted were most of the programs. Sorry for that. Were um, sorry. I'll wait till they're done. Teleworking. Great phenomenon. Okay. So as I uh, continue to uh, work here, um, at least the dog's not barking. Um, he's facing opposition from uh, people on the uh, ideological left, uh, right, of, of his party, who are saying he's not doing enough. So I mentioned that in the first New Deal, it tended to be a rather conservative package in that it was designed to sort of save capitalism and provide relief uh, for banks, uh, regulation of the stock market. But these were, it was basically addressing sort of major sort of pillars and foundational pieces of the economy and sort of uh, strengthening, in some cases, um, attempting to clean them up or, um, or heavily regulate them in the case of, of the NRA. But it, it was addressing um, the interests and uh, the stability of business. People were arguing that he wasn't doing enough to help the average citizen. Okay. And so this resulted in a lot of criticism. So this is what um, Schlesinger referred to as thunder on the left. Um, the, we, we see, for example, um, the uh, appeal of um, the Communist Party growing, the, the CPUSA, Communist Party USA. Um, world War I, of course, was a very traumatic experience for a lot of people around the world. Millions of people died for no apparent reason. Um, and this communist vision of a world regime uh, held uh, this promise for world peace for a lot of people, um, I think they were told, right? Um, by 1939-41, its popularity was declining in Britain and the United States as the truth leaked out about what was going on in the Soviet Union. 
uh, under uh, Joseph Stalin, the, 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 the terror famine in the Ukraine, uh, the purges of 1935. But um, around 1935, before all the truth of what was going on in the Soviet Union began to leak out, many Americans during the Great Depression began to sympathize with communism. And, and the United States Communist Party um, reaches its all-time sort of peak during the mid-1930s at 60,000 members, which is really a drop in the bucket in um, the big picture of how many people live in the United States, right? But nonetheless, 60,000 60, members uh, would have been unthinkable uh, before. So it's a very, very large um, uh, population for, for the Communist Party at this time. Um, we also have folks that uh, your textbook mentions, right? We had uh, Huey Long, the governor of Louisiana, with his Share Our Wealth program, which was essentially um, – wealth distribution program. He, he, his, his idea was to tax <clears throat> the wealthiest Americans um, to give a $5,000 check uh, to, every, to every American and guarantee everyone a $2,500 uh, yearly salary. Um, so this is very much uh, fixing incomes. Um, not that this uh, plan did not have um, a lot of fans uh, among the poor. Uh, Roosevelt also received criticism uh, from Father Coughlin, who was the radio preacher from Detroit, Michigan, very anti-Semitic. He was a, a Roman Catholic um, radio, called himself a radio priest, did these weekly broadcasts that had uh, millions of listeners. Uh, and he was um, very anti-Semitic um, in his rhetoric, um, referred to Roosevelt's programs as the Jew deal. And... Um, you know, was advocating that Roosevelt was essentially a uh, a tool of international Jewish banking interests, right? And um, this led to sort of anti uh, anti Semitic sentiment in the United States. And uh, then he had Father or Doctor, excuse me, Doctor Francis Townsend, uh, who was a San Francisco retired San Francisco physician. Uh, who was advocating that senior citizens be paid um, to retire in order to open up jobs uh, in the economy for younger people. In other words, uh, people were afraid to leave, leave their jobs because in the Depression, they, they wouldn't have any income. It wasn't safe to try to retire at this time. So the idea was that they would be paid to retire, and then this would open up jobs in the economy for younger people. Meanwhile, in paying these people to retire, they would then spend that income and help stimulate sales um, in the economy. Um, Roosevelt, all of this pressure coming at him from the left side of uh, the political spectrum, um, including, the, including the, uh, the campaign of uh, the author Upton Sinclair uh, running for governor of California in 1934 uh, on, a, on a socialistic platform, really, what we could call a, a proto-socialistic kind of platform that Upton Sinclair ran for, ran on uh, for California governor in 1934. All of this sort of left-leaning political um, sentiment begins to pull Roosevelt to the political left. If he wishes to get reelected in 1936, he's going to have to find a way to occupy or co-opt some of that political ground that these other voices, this thunder on the left, uh, now um, occupies. And um, as Huey Long prepares to enter the governor of Louisiana, well, no, I'm sorry, former governor of Louisiana, now senator of Louisiana, uh, from Louisiana, begins to uh, throw his hat in the ring as a third party candidate in 1936. Um, there's a very real chance that um, Huey Long could draw enough votes away from the Democratic Party that Roosevelt could wind up losing to the Republican candidate Alf Landon, uh, the uh, governor of Kansas. Ultimately, Roosevelt will win re-election in 1936. Now, interestingly, in 1935-36, he begins his second New Deal program. And he begins to offer programs that address specifically the, the needs of working class people. For example, um, 
Roosevelt comes out with the Social Security Administration, which pays people at the age of 65 to retire. Hmm, where did we hear this before? He co-ops the, take, the ideas of Dr. Francis Townsend and comes out with the Social Security Administration in order to sort of take that political position, put it into effect and say, you know, okay, I'm, I'm taking these ideas, right? Um, but he's listening to, what, to what's going on out there, but he's also using it to his political advantage to shore up his position. The Works Progress Administration, um, which included the, the National Youth Administration, the Rural Electrification Administration, um, the uh, Wagner Act, which was passed in 1937, uh, uh, creating the National Labor Relations Board, uh, and uh, the, um, the Wagner Act, which specifically um, requires companies to bargain in good faith with labor unions. Um, all of these things uh, in the Second New Deal of Roosevelt are more left-leaning in that they look to address uh, actual um, needs of working class people uh, rather than the economy at the sort of 10,000-foot uh, level, if you will. Right? Um, interestingly, and in, well, Unfortunately, tragically, interestingly, you, you, you decide for yourself. Um, but in 1936, Huey Long uh, was assassinated, which ended his presidential run. Uh, he had been referred to by Franklin Roosevelt as one of the two most dangerous men in the United States. Um, he wound up being assassinated and therefore was not able to run for president. Uh, and Roosevelt wins the 1936 election. I'm just saying that's what happened. Okay. okay. Um, there are several films uh, based on the life of Huey Long. Very interesting to check out. You may be familiar with the film, a 1949 um, Academy Award winner, Best Picture and Best Actor was uh, Robert Crawford uh, for the film All the King's Men. Okay. The original classic version, 1949, great Oscar, Oscar winning film which was, uh, gives you a Huey Long type character, but th the names are changed to protect the innocent, right? Or guilty. So awesome uh, Hollywood film to check out. A remake of this was made many years later with Robert De Niro, uh, All the King's Men. I believe this was done back in the 90s or early 2000s. Um, and then uh, back in the 1990s, also uh, the TNT network, back when they used to do uh, made for TV historical films, made a film called Kingfish, uh, which is a biography of Huey Long starring uh, John Goodman as the Kingfish, John Goodman, formerly of uh, the husband on the Roseanne show, uh, the original Roseanne show. And uh, he's also made a good appearance in the George Clooney film, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, in fact, I might even see if I can dig up the Kingfish, uh, see if I can find that on YouTube, and maybe I'll ask you guys to watch that just for uh, interesting, uh, interesting entertainment uh, story of Huey Long, um, or maybe we'll watch a Marx Brothers movie instead. Anyway, um, the Second New Deal, in many ways, responds to the political pressure um, being exerted on Roosevelt from this quote-unquote uh, thunder on the left. Okay, uh, and, and I forgot to even mention the National Farmers Alliance under uh, Milo Reno, uh, and this was. Um, uh, trying to deal with, again, agricultural issues where farmers out in uh, Nebraska and Wyoming uh, who had essentially just decided enough was enough of banks seizing farmers' properties um, and they wanted to stop declining, declining prices uh, in the markets uh, of farm products, uh, these guys would, uh, when banks were attempting to um, have foreclosure sales uh, of someone's farm, all the shot the farmers in the county would show up with shotguns at the at the at the auction and it was made to be understood by everybody before this began that no property was going to sell for more than $100 and then what would happen was money could be raised or possibly the farm owner would have enough money to then purchase back that property for $100 so the bidding, they were there standing there with shotguns, making sure no one bid above $100 to make sure that these farms didn't change hands. Um, they were also pulling tractors out into the middle of highways 
uh, to block delivery trucks from taking farm goods to markets because if there were too many goods in the markets, the prices would be too low and they were trying to stabilize and raise farm prices. So they would sit on tractors with shotguns preventing people from taking their goods to market. So um, the National Farmers Alliance um, were a bunch of farmers who were not messing around. Um, so this was additional uh, pressure on Roosevelt to get something done about uh, agriculture. And um, of course, there was a second Agricultural Adjustment Act passed, I believe it was in 1938, uh, that did not attempt to mess with um, interstate uh, farm activity. So we had the Social Security Act, the National Industrial Recovery Act, the Rural Electrification Act, which looked to bring um, electricity to poverty-stricken areas in the United States where that did not exist, particularly Western Texas and those areas of the Southwest. Um, in fact, Lyndon, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, helped launch his political career working as a New Deal uh, representative in that part of Texas, right? So again, understanding the New Deal, um, as, we, as we look to sort of wrap up here, I'll ask you guys to look at your um, textbook chapter um, about that, chapter 25. Um, and again, I agree with the formatting uh, of your textbook chapter. Um, I, I think that uh, the author um, uh, sort of takes a page from Schlesinger also. Um, so I, I encourage you to think about the New Deal program as there was a first New Deal. There was this thunder on the left in the, in, in the 1935, 36 period there. Um, that, and we can even start with Upton Sinclair running for Governor of California in 1934, and that these things now begin to force Franklin Roosevelt to move, I forget, you guys are over there, from the political right to the political left to begin to occupy some of these more popular political positions that are being held by people like Townsend and, and Long and um, Coughlin uh, and um, Milo Reno. And, and, and the farmers, um, uh, the farmers alliance, right? He has to respond to these critiques um, and find a way to, to see some of that political landscape in order to get himself reelected. And then we will see, pardon me, the second New Deal much more focused now on um, relief of people rather than uh, relief of the system. All right. So make sure in your documents reader to check out um, the remaining documents uh, in chapter 25 of your documents reader having to do with the depression. Uh, they have to do with um, uh, commentaries by uh, women in the depression, um, African-American African leaders responding to uh, the depression. There's a piece in there on Roosevelt's court packing scheme. It's really hacky. Um, sorry, that, that's, uh, that's my very objective straight out. That was a wrong headed idea. Like people in Congress are talking about doing that now. That's a wrong-headed idea. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, there were a couple more pieces, and I think there were five more documents. So read the rest of those because they'll be useful to you for the final exam. Okay, and then uh, tomorrow I'll be recording a lecture for you on uh, America and the global crisis, talking about the um, American foreign policy outlooks of the 1930s that are responding to rise of fascism and Japanese militarism. Uh, and you can read about those events in the first 10, eight or 10 pages of chapter 26 of your textbook. All right. So um, again, be safe out there and uh, see you in the next video.